Now to help us with navigating our issues with self-esteem or our issues with our very extreme emotions, we also have to learn how to develop lots of emotional skills. And there's lots of emotional skills we could talk about in this course. We could be talking about this for a whole semester, but we're gonna limit it to four general areas of emotional skills. And they're gonna be self-regulation, resilience, empathy, and autonomy. So by self-regulation, I'm really talking about the skill to handle your very strong emotions and to self-soothe. Sometimes we experience really intense anger or fear or sadness, and we don't want to have them right at that point in time. And so we need to overcome them or work through them. And we see this early on in infancy. Self-soothing skills start right off in infancy, primarily through sucking, through feeding on the bottle or a breast or a pacifier. Infants are able to calm themselves down and soothe. And some infants who prefer just to nurse, sometimes not for feeding purposes, but just for comfort and bonding, will just nurse on their parent for many hours as a form of emotional regulation. Once we're weaned off the nipple and we're moving and we're walking and talking as toddlers, we start to express our emotions in a much more outward way. And when it comes to things like anger and frustration, or even some things like just being overtired or overstimulated, toddlers tend to take their frustration out towards others. And they tend to express that emotions outward. So this is the idea they will cry, they will bite or kick, or they will run away, or they will do a very common tantrum. Tantrums are very typical and very normative. And so sometimes tantrums are very violent. Some tantrums are really cute, where they will simply just flop down on the ground. For instance, some tantrums are simply a toddler flopping to the ground, putting their hands over their eyes, and just giving themselves a moment. That's showing that they're overstimulated and they're actually trying to regulate this. They might be crying the whole time and hoping for attention and hoping that maybe they'll get what they'll want, but it also is really good to help deal with this surge of emotions. What's going on when we feel anger and stress and sadness is you get this really huge biochemical influx of proteins in your system and it can be really overwhelming. And so by using this a technique of putting your hands over your face and just flopping to the ground or flopping on a couch, it can really help us to regulate that and giving the toddler time and space they need is really good. We don't want to see a toddler biting and kicking too much and so that often starts to interplay with how we respond to them and how we parent or discipline from a very early age. But then as we move into like three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old zone, we start to see less flopping on the floor and screaming when one's upset and we more to see this constructive regulation. And this is more so when the preschooler will be upset by something, but they won't just scream about it. Instead, they will quickly walk into another room or go to the bathroom and they'll cry in private. Or maybe they'll say, okay, and then they'll go out of the playroom and they'll just kind of cry in the hallway. They're not so much crying for manipulation at this point, but they're allowing themselves to have privacy to release and deal with this system. Speaking of which, when you cry, you do release proteins. It does help you with homeostasis. It is a good thing to cry. And crying is a fantastic way to help self-regulate and get yourself under control. And so dealing with emotions like sadness often involves expressing those emotions. I enjoy the Disney Pixar movie Inside Out because it talks about when something really intense is going on, sometimes just coating it with happiness is not the right way to regulate. Sometimes the correct way to regulate is actually going into those really potent but unpleasant emotions that are very adaptive and allowing yourself to feel them fully. And so kids are very good at this from early on. We might socialize this out of them and we might tell them based on the social norms in our culture what they're allowed to express and what they should regulate when. But it's important for us to, when we're alone and when we're in solitude, to be okay expressing these highly potent emotions. So having a good cry helps us to reach homeostasis. It allows us to shed some of the overwhelming proteins and we can go back and feel more content afterwards. So this helps us to gain skills later on in our childhood, adolescence, and adulthood that when we're really overwhelmed by something, if we don't want to scream at our boss or cry in the workplace, we just need to be alone and seek out that solitude and seek out that moment of reflection to help gain control. That everything to do with anger and sadness and fear is pretty normal in everyday life, but there's some social norms about when and where we can display these emotions. So finding the closet or the washroom where you're allowed to display them is totally a professional outlet to focus on that. 
We also know that just bottling up your emotions and never expressing them is not beneficial. And those who bottle up their emotions, they just, that sense of arousal keeps building in them under the surface and they actually continue to get more tense under the surface, even though they're gritting their teeth and saying they're not upset. And so bottling up actually leads to more stress and actually lowers your immune system's functioning versus allowing a safe expression of the emotions helps us to stay healthier. Now, another component of self-regulation is not just regulating the more unpleasant emotions, but also delaying things like gratification or impulses. So delayed gratification is the idea that we really, really want something and it's gonna bring us joy if we go for it right away, but it's better to wait for it. And this is something that takes us a while to develop. Kids, even at the age of three and four, are really struggling with this. Other words used for delayed gratification are things like inhibition. And that's because you have to inhibit your impulses. This is the idea if you think of like a neuron and its action potential, you have to inhibit the action potential. And so inhibition is the idea you inhibit the action potential, you inhibit your behavior. So you don't just jump into the things that you really impulsively desire. This is like the idea you don't blow your whole paycheck on a toy, you pay your bills first. Or you don't overindulge on junk food and make yourself sick, you eat a healthy supper and have a light dessert. And so this is something that we obviously continue to develop all through our lifespan. It's something biologically we're driven away from. We're biologically set to eat the yummiest food we see right away and be desired to survive off short-term goals rather than long-term goals. But allowing ourselves to focus more on the long-term goals is meaningful. It helps us with this impulse control and it helps us with a different type of temperament known as effortful control. We didn't talk about it in our Thomas and Chess theory of temperament, but Mary Rothbard says that some of us are just born with more effortful control. We're more calm, we're able to inhibit these impulses and stay on track, versus other of us are not. We have low effortful control and we are just biologically more impulsive people. That means that if you're just a more impulsive person, you have to work harder at obtaining these skills around delayed gratification. Delayed gratification can take lots of forms. It could be putting your phone away and actually reading your books and stop checking social media. That can be really hard to do. It could also be things like the classic marshmallow test in developmental psychology, in which young children were confronted by placing one marshmallow in front of them and being told, you can eat that marshmallow now, or I'm gonna leave and come back in five minutes. And if that marshmallow is still there in five minutes, you'll get two marshmallows. And we know that in the original study, lots of young children couldn't wait the five minutes. They ate the one marshmallow as soon as the researchers left versus if they could wait and receive two marshmallows, they tended to have higher effortful control or better inhibition or more developed delayed gratification. And so this idea they can think more long-term rather than thinking more short-term. So self-regulation is not just about regulating our bad emotions, but also regulating things like our impulses. And self-regulation has to go with when we're upset, how do we choose to deal with that? And again, right early on in toddlerhood, when we were doing lots of aggression and frustration and biting and kicking and hitting, we are doing what's known as an externalizing coping strategy. And that's when, when things are frustrating for us, we take that frustration and we throw it outward. It's very typical for all of us to start off with an outward coping strategy or an externalizing coping strategy. This is the idea that we hit others, we break things, we throw things, and that is how we're dealing with our frustration. And if this continues on, we see an elementary age child who will throw books down the staircase or they'll break things at school, they'll snap their pencils, they'll shove people on the lineup. And as this continues into an adulthood, you might see people who get in fist fights at a local bar or you might see people who have criminal convictions. Most of us, however, move away from using the external strategies, at least some of the time, and we use more internalizing strategies. This starts off when we're in preschool and we're doing the more controlled and constructive reflection, but sometimes it's not too constructive. Sometimes we just exit the room and we cry to ourselves and we blame ourselves. Or sometimes we don't even cry. We just, instead of putting our anger and frustration outward, we pull it all inward and we become very anxious, very over-controlled, very upset, very sad. And this can be a real major risk factor for when we're in childhood, we might be at a higher risk for anxiety, depression, loneliness, low self-esteem, because we're taking all our frustration and we're blaming it in on top of ourselves. And this can carry on into adulthood. When we, whenever something goes wrong, we replay it in our mind like a movie and we ruminate on it. And it's not really constructive. We're just constantly blaming ourselves and how we're dealing with our frustration and our angst is to just torture ourselves and tell ourselves it's all our fault. A better way to approach this is to develop the pro-social coping strategies. And these are neither external nor internal. Rather than throwing our frustration outward or wrapping it all inward, pro-social allows us 
to consider it in a more objective and rational way. We might think about it, but we're not ruminating and torturing ourselves. We're rationalizing and saying, okay, that wasn't my fault. They're just having a bad day. That's on them. I didn't do anything wrong. I can go about my business. And so pro-social coping strategies allows us to kind of shrug it off. We don't get upset as much. We are okay moving on. Sometimes it's hard to do this independently, and another type of pro-social coping strategy is to reach out to others, to talk about our feelings to others. Not in a blaming them sort of way, but more in a, hey, this really bad thing happened to me and I just have to get it out of my system. That allows you to get it out of your system in a neither externalizing nor internalizing way. It can also help us to ask someone to be a mediator. Hey, my friend pushed me and I don't know if it's because I did something wrong or what's going on. Could you just reach out to them and see if there's something I need to know about or something I need to apologize for? And so reaching out to a mediator or talking it over with someone or rationalizing it in your own head, not ruminating it, can all be considered pro-social coping strategies. And we start to get better at these as we move along. Some of us are better at pro-social early on in childhood. Some of us will always remain externalizing and internalizing throughout the lifespan. But if we consciously decide to, we can all start to develop more pro-social coping strategies as we grow older.